All right, let's go. Well, I had these great plans to make a really creative video out here hiking in the snow today. Winter has finally arrived here in Colorado, by the way. But it is absolutely brutally cold this week. It's five degrees right now Fahrenheit. And the problem is cameras don't like cold weather or more specifically, their batteries don't like cold weather. But I wanted to show you a little bit of the park and we'll head back home and finish this video in the office. Oh yeah, stick around to the end of the video. Fuller has made a great resource available for free during the month of March. So I will have details on that study guide and the resources at the end of this video. Well, that was extremely cold outside. I think I froze my fingertips off trying to work the little buttons on the camera. But we are in the second Sunday of Lent, and our reading for this week comes from Luke 13, verses 31 through 35. I'm going to be reading the Revised Standard Version today. Luke 13, 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. If you're new here, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Paris. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminaries and other graduate institutions for the past 20 or 30 years and bring it to anyone who's interested on YouTube. So do me a favor. Give it a thumbs up, like it, let other people know about it, and subscribe to it. All of these things help me because YouTube then knows that these are good videos that they should let other people know about. So I really appreciate you doing that for me. Thanks. Lent is often referred to as a journey. Why do we call it a journey if most of us are not going anywhere? I'll get to that. Lent is a season when we turn away from our worldly distractions and turn back to God a time of inner reflection. At the end of our journey through Lent, we should find ourselves at a different place spiritually than when we started. The English word for Lent comes from, wait, let's do a quick pop quiz. What is the etymological root for Lent? A, the Latin lentitio for reading. B, the old German lenzo for penance. C, the Old English, Lenten, for spring, or D, the original Greek, Leneo, for sorrow or repentance. If you said C, the Old English, Lent, you would be correct. I think our forefathers thought that the Latin, Quadra Gesima, may have been a bit over the top and just went for the season of spring to refer to the 40 days leading up to Easter. What I want to do today is look at the idea of Lent as a journey. This idea of a journey is found in many of the lectionary readings for Lent. For example, in last Sunday's reading from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 26, the Feast of First Fruits is instituted, but it reflects on Israel's journey to the land that they were about to inherit, and Abraham is called a wandering Aramean in it, 26 verse 5. On the fourth Sunday, we read from Joshua 5, 9 through 12. Israel arrives in the Promised Land, Gilgal, and the manna stops. That week also has a reading from Luke, the parable of the prodigal son. 
And in that parable, one son goes away on a journey and one stays at home, but is very, very far from his father. This week's reading in Genesis 15 talks about Abraham's journey. In this reading, God reaffirms his covenant with Abraham in the middle of that journey. He says, I am the Lord who brought you up from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Abraham is on a journey from Ur, over in modern-day Iraq, to modern-day Israel, a journey that consumed most of his adult life and was filled with some accomplishments and all manner of setbacks and challenges. This week's reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through the beginning of chapter 4, Paul talks about our citizenship is in heaven, chapter 3, verse 20. This is the city that we are headed to. We are sojourners on this earth, seeking and searching for our rightful home. In this week's gospel reading, which I read earlier, Jesus states, yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem where he will be killed, and almost half the Gospel of Luke is dedicated to this journey. Luke considers it that important. In fact, the word Jerusalem is used three times in a row, at the very end of 1333, and then twice at the very start of verse 34. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This draws our attention to the destiny of Jesus' pilgrimage. One final example comes from the video I did two weeks ago on the Transfiguration by Raphael. I have a link to that video up over here. When Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they talk to him about his departure in 931. And, uh, wait for it, time for another pop quiz. And don't worry, I didn't cover this in that video, so this puts everybody on equal footing. What does the Greek word that's translated as departure in Luke 9.31 mean? A. Exodus, like the title of the book, Exodus. B. Death. C. Moving from one spot to another to depart. Or D. Destination. We are headed towards a destination. If you picked any of them, A, B, C, or D above, you would be correct. It's really a trick question and needed another answer, E, all of the above. I think Luke specifically picked this word for this passage because of this range of meaning. The original readers would have seen that they could be talking about Jesus' destination, Jerusalem, his journey to Jerusalem, his death in Jerusalem, or implying a direct connection between Israel's exodus and that in the Old Testament. As Israel was led for 40 years in the wilderness to the Promised Land, so Moses and Elijah are now talking with Jesus about his exodus, the deliverance he is going to lead his people on from this world to the Promised World. And the Greek word, if you're interested there for departure, is the word exodus. The readings for Lent are loaded with references to journeys, so keep your eyes out for them as you journey through Lent. But that only partially answers the question of why do we call Lent a journey? The metaphor of a journey. Sometimes a journey is geographical. Abraham wandered most of his life from Ur to the Promised Land. Moses fled Egypt only to find true love and then meet God, who then led him back to Egypt to rescue his people and lead them out. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and Jesus' journeys to Jerusalem are all examples. In the final weeks of his life, Jesus is moving ever closer to Jerusalem, and that's where most of the readings during Lent come from for the Gospels. Not even threats from Herod and Antipas, the fox, deterred him from his final destination. He was on a sacred pilgrimage set by God. Why throughout church history have so many called Lent a journey? Well, one of the most basic metaphors that almost every language employs is that of applying a journey to aspects of our lives. As human beings, we speak about goals, and we talk about them a lot. Often we talk about achieving goals in terms of undertaking a journey. A journey has a starting point, a destination, and some way to get from here to there. Because goals lie in the future, 
they're ahead of us. And as we traverse a path to move towards the future, our goal, if we move forward, we're getting closer to our goal. If we stop or back up, we tend to think that we are failing or not achieving our goal or hit some kind of obstacle. When Elijah and Moses meet and talk with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration about his exodus, I'm sure they're not talking about which road it's the best to take. Rather, I think they're discussing the difficulties, hardships, and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would have to make. But often we use the idea of a journey even when we go nowhere. We are not on a geographical journey during Lent. It's a temporal one. The 40 days leading to Easter are a journey. When we talk about Lent being a journey, we're not talking about driving across town or to another town. A journey involves exploration, uncertainty, and time. Think about the refugees fleeing the Ukraine right now. They're setting out from war and destruction, hopefully to a refuge, safety. What that is, they have no idea at all. Where that is, they don't know either. They have set out on a journey. Our entire lives are also a journey, from birth until death, from faith to realization. And Lent is a mini six-week journey that we revisit every year that is part of our lifelong journey. It serves an important role of resetting recalibrating our compass, direction, and orientation in our lives on its longer journey. The disciplines we engage in during Lent are meant to challenge us. Sometimes we'll succeed at them, other times we might fail. But we learn and grow and through them prepare for Easter. Mapping our journey onto Lent. So how do we map all of this onto Lent? Since most of us are not going to be going on a pilgrimage journey, but we are moving towards Easter, and our journey is the season of Lent. What are our goals during this season? Prayer, discipline, spiritual awakening, drawing closer to God, serving others? I personally love the idea of physical journeys. In May, I'm going to do a three-day mountain bike ride from Grand Junction to Moab, Utah, across the high desert. It's tough. It challenges me. It changes me but it is so rewarding. During the medieval period, those with the means would often go on a pilgrimage journey to Rome, Jerusalem, or some other holy destination to achieve their spiritual goals. And being the disgruntled spoil sports that they were, the Protestant Reformation leaders really killed the idea and tradition of pilgrimages within the Protestant churches mainly because they feel their followers would be influenced by Catholic ideas and theology while on a pilgrimage. Charles Foster writes in The Sacred Journey, the Protestant reformers by and large disapproved of pilgrimage and disapproved violently. They frowned at the cult of relics. They raged against indulgences often associated with visits to pilgrimage sites. They thought the whole business was paralyzingly superstitious and fed the heresy that you could work out your own salvation. And so, as far as they could, they shut it down. As a result, the Protestant church lost contact with the tradition of pilgrimages, something that's being rediscovered today, though. Some of the more popular pilgrimage sites today include Iona in Scotland, the ruins of Lindisfarne in England, the Taizé community in France, And of course, the Grand Queen Mother of them all, the Camino de Santiago de Compostela in Spain. But like during the medieval period, not many of us are gonna have the chance to make one of these pilgrimages. How can you make Lent a journey, a pilgrimage? Many Catholic churches have the 14 stations of the cross around the church walls. This is a way for local parishioners to reenact Jesus' path down the Via Doloroso in Jerusalem at their church. But you could get creative where you live. Take a half hour walk each day during Lent. That's what I was trying to do today. Contemplate a portion of Luke's gospel as you do. Or pray as you go on that walk. Set aside some time each day to read the lectionary readings for that day. This only takes a few minutes, but it's well worth it. And I will have a link to the Revised Common Lectionary online under this video if you're interested. 
So you can go to the website, scroll down, find today's date. So for the second Sunday in Lent, if you tap on it, it brings up the entire readings for you and you can just read it. And oftentimes I'll take this with me on my walk and then I can read the lectionary readings as I go. Lent doesn't have to be just about giving up something. You can also take up something as well. I would love to hear what kinds of creative suggestions you have for how you're going to make Lent a journey. A lot of you are a lot more creative than I am. So please put your ideas in the comments under this video so I can learn from your ideas as well. Our destination through the Lenten journey is Easter or at the empty tomb. Lent is not just about some way to grind your way through this time of year. It's a journey and we should grow and learn from it as well. Once we reach our Easter destination, we should not be at the same place that we started at. Now all of our journeys will start from a new location. But our journey will not truly be over until the promised second advent of Christ. So until next week, oh, I almost forgot. I promised I would let you know about the resource that Fuller's making available. During the month of March, Fuller's making available a study guide entitled, She Is. After doing my study on the women in Genesis, I am really excited to see them make this available. It's a collection of diverse perspectives that share the unique lens that each author sees in these biblical women. You can download it to your computer or print it out. I've looked it through and it looks like an excellent study. So if you are personally interested or would like to use this for a study group, be sure to check out this resource and I'll include the link underneath this video so that you can go to it and download it yourself. There's no obligation if you do. Until next week when we continue our journey through Lent, Peace.